All right, my clock says two o'clock, so we can go ahead and get started. Um, I just posted the link in the handout and are posted a couple times if for those joining us. Um, so welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, I am Katie Stope. I'm the local history librarian here at Appleton Public Library. And um, I just have a few quick announcements um, to begin us or to before we can begin. Um, so again, thank you for joining us today. We're gonna be talking about Civil War ancestors today. Um, first, I have a couple news items for those in Wisconsin or the Fox Valley area, or for those who are thinking of visiting Appleton. Um, we are currently closed. If you haven't heard the news, um, we are renovating our current library. So in order to do that, we had to close and we'll be moving to a temporary location over the next few weeks. Um, so we're closed until May 23rd. And on May 23rd, we're gonna open up at that temporary location, which is the former Best Buy building on Kensington Drive. And we'll be there for about 18 months while we remodel that library. During the closure, you can still um, contact us via phone Monday through Friday, 9 to 5. And we also have an email um, that we'll be answering um, reference questions and things. And that information is on the handout, which I've posted the link a few times in the chat and are posted again. Um, unfortunately for all of, all of you genealogists and researchers, we're not going to have our microfilm machines or our microfilm um, in that temp location. Unfortunately, it's about a third of the size of the library, so there's just not enough room for it. Um, but again, you can reach out to us via phone or email if you have any article requests for the Post Crescent and we can access that as staff to get it sent to you. Um, thankfully during this closure we can still continue our amazing library programs like the Find Your Ancestors series and we're going to continue those virtually for now since that temporary location space does not have enough in-person um, you know space for us to hold a program like this. Um, so you know, take a look at our events calendar and see what other awesome in-person programs we're gonna have throughout the city all summer and the next 18 months um, as we're gonna continue to add more programs in the community. Um, a huge thank you to the friends of the Appleton Public Library for pro providing funding for the Find Your Ancestors series. We wouldn't be able to do it without their support and they have, you know, kept us going virtually every month, um, you know, since 2020. So this has been awesome. Uh, for those unfamiliar with the Find Your Ancestors series, we do this once a month, every month. Um, so definitely check out the handout where I have a couple links to our upcoming programs. Um, so our next session is going to be May 14th, and I'm actually going to be your presenter. I'm going to be talking about getting the most out of Ancestry.com. So whether you have a subscription that you pay for or you're using the free library edition, I have lots of tips and tricks that I'm going to share with you to make sure that you're getting the most out of using that website. Um, so check the link for the handout out you can go ahead and register there and I also have links for June, July, and August um, for Find Your Ancestors. Um, just be aware that during the summer we are transitioning from the Saturday at 2 o'clock time to a Thursday at 6 p.m. just for the summer because it um, coincides with our library open hours. Um, so Upcoming, we have June um, is going to be Wisconsin resources, July is going to be talking about school records, and August is all about Fold 3 Library Edition. So again, take a look at the handout and register for those programs. And just a reminder that if you register for the programs now, you're going to remind your email a week before, a day before, and an hour before the program. So it's a nice little reminder. If you missed any of our past sessions, go ahead and check out our YouTube channel. Again, the link is in the handout for that. Um, we are recording today's session and I have that up and send out an email to everybody who registered um, with that recording link, hopefully on Monday. If you have any um, questions during today's session, you can feel free to type them into the Q&A box located on the bottom of the screen and either myself or our presenter today um, will answer those questions at the end. We also have closed captioning enabled. If you need it, you can uh, feel free to push the closed captioning button on the bottom of your screen, or you can feel free to turn it off. Um, just be aware that those are not 100% accurate since it is a live transcript. If you have any library specific questions or need help navigating in our, any of our genealogy databases or you know have a genealogy question that you you know have thought of that you know after the session ends that you'd want to email me my email is in the handout so feel free to reach out i also offer one-on-one -on -one sessions via zoom um, with the library closed that's the only way to do it right now is via zoom um, so feel free to reach out and book me for a one-on-one -on -one. 
And then um, at the end of today's presentation, uh, once you close out of Zoom, a survey from Project Outcome, which is an American Library Association sponsored survey, is going to pop up. It's just a quick eight question survey if you have a minute um, to just let us know, give us your feedback and let us know what you thought of today's pr presentation. We would greatly appreciate that. There's also a spot to let us know what future topics you'd like us to present on for Find Your Ancestors. Um, and since I'm still planning the rest of 2022, those are really helpful um, when people type in what topics they're looking for us to present. So without further ado, I can introduce our speaker today. Today we have Russell Horton. He is the Reference and Outreach Archivist at the Wisconsin Veterans Museum. And during his 20 years there, he has helped thousands of genealogists learn more about a veteran in their family tree. He also helps to share the stories of Wisconsin veterans with students, local historians, and academic researchers. So everyone, welcome Russ. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. And thank you everyone for joining uh, today. Um, I'm really pleased to see so many people uh, um, joining in. So hopefully I'll be able to give you some useful information and um, I'll answer questions at the end and um, see what we can do here. So I am the reference archivist at the Wisconsin Veterans Museum in Madison. Um, we are a museum that specializes in telling the stories of of Wisconsin veterans from the Civil War through the present. And one of my jobs as reference archivist is to help genealogists and, and it's something that I enjoy doing and um, I'm assuming you enjoy it as well. So let's let's get going here. Hey Russ, they're saying um, they're having an issue with your volume. Can you speak louder? Or can you adjust your mic a little bit? Sure, let me see here. I apologize for that. Um, I can hear you okay, but I think I have really great hearing, so. <laughs> Okay. Um, I'm just looking at the settings here. I can try to talk a little louder. Is this is this better? I do have a voice that projects, and I usually use it when I'm in in-person presentations. But uh, on Zoom, I think I've gotten lazy with it. Yeah, people say some people say it's better. Some people said not. So. <laughs> okay. Well, I apologize. I'll try to speak loudly. Um, but please, if if you're not hearing as well, feel free to follow up with me after the presentation. I apologize. Okay, so um, when I help genealogists for any conflict, but particularly for the Civil War, there are some common questions that people often have to start out with. It's not always tell me about my great grandparents. Sometimes it's something very specific like, um, you know, where did, where did he serve? Was he wounded in battle? Um, did he earn any awards? They, there often is a family story, right? Family lore. I, I heard that my great grandfather was at Gettysburg. Um, you might have a, a military form, a discharge form or something and not understand what an abbreviation on it means. Or there might be some military jargon on there and you're not quite sure exactly what that means. You might have something from your ancestor and not be sure what it is or if you're super forward thinking, um, you might have um, some things from your ancestors and want to be sure that you find a permanent home for them so that future generations can enjoy them as well. These are all questions that I get. They're questions I can help answer. I'm going to try to talk about each of those questions throughout this presentation. But again, feel free to follow up if I miss anything or if I don't answer it um, quite the way that you were hoping. Um, I can talk to you after the presentation as well. Uh, an example um, that I like to give a genealogist when they're starting to delve into military genealogy is to sort of think of it um, as a foreign language. So if you, if any of you have done research um, in a different country, uh, genealogy research, if you've had to write to a different country to, to find out about an ancestor before they came here, um, you know, other countries have different ways of storing records. They have um, words and terms that might mean something a little bit different uh, in, in that country than it does in the States. And I would suggest that military genealogy is somewhat similar to that. Um, there are words sometimes in the military that mean something quite different than they do uh, in civilian records. Um, I have some examples on this slide of, of words that you might run across when you're starting to research a, a Civil War veteran. And you might know what some of them mean. You might not know what some of them mean. And, and you might kind of suspect that you know what one means and, and maybe not really. So um, again, this is just kind of a, a way of saying that I encourage 
people starting to do military genealogy to not try to do it all themselves. Um, there are things that can throw you off. And if you, if you start moving on a, an incorrect assumption, it can really set you back in terms of time and research. So please ask for help. Um, and I wanna suggest that, that the Wisconsin Veterans Museum is a great place to get that help. We do specialize in telling military stories and thus we are familiar with the records. We're familiar with the terminology and the abbreviations and the jargon. Um, so please feel free to use us. We are here to help. Um, we are happy, happy to help people learn more about Wisconsin veterans. I want to talk just a little bit about our institution before I get into the sources too much. Um, our museum actually started in 1901. It was called the GAR Memorial Hall. Um, if, if any of you have been digging into Civil War history, um, you might know that GAR stands for Grand Army of the Republic. It was the first major veterans organization in our country. It was composed of Union veterans, and um, they, they gained a tremendous amount of um, political power in the late 19th century um, and early, early 20th century. And in Wisconsin, um, one of the things they did with that power was create uh, a hall in the state capitol um, to preserve the memories of the service of Wisconsin men uh, in the Civil War. And you can see here a picture of the original GAR Memorial Hall in the capitol with a couple Civil War vets. Um, this is the origin of our museum uh, again in 1901. Um, in over the course of time, uh, the, the control of the museum passed from the GAR to the Wisconsin Department of Veterans Affairs um, right after World War II. And, and today we are part of the Wisconsin Department of Veterans Affairs. So we are a state institution um, supported by the state and we exist to help keep alive uh, the memories of Wisconsin veterans. Uh, in 1993, we moved out of the Capitol into a brand new museum, which is still in the Capitol Square. If you look out the window in this picture, you can kind of see the Capitol out there. Um, if some of you have done research in archives before, you might know that a lot of times they're kind of dark and dingy and dusty, but um, our archives, which opened in 2001, is on the third floor of our building. We have windows, there's sunshine, it's fantastic. Um, so if any of you are in, uh, planning on coming to Madison, feel free to reach out and, and set up a research appointment and we're happy to help you there. But I wanna stress this, we are very uh, much able to help by distance as well. So you do not have to come to Madison to use um, some of the resources that I'm gonna be talking about today. Um, we are more than happy to help you virtually. Some of the things that we have that I'll be talking about more uh, throughout this presentation, we have letters, diaries, photographs, and other papers from individual Wisconsin veterans, so original primary sources. Um, we have uh, records from state and local veterans organizations, and I'll talk a little bit later about how those can be useful in your genealogy. Um, military history library with things like memoirs, reminiscences, published letters, um, that, that again can all be useful. Uh, we have it, not going to help so much with the Civil War genealogy, but just so you know, we do have, um, I think I just heard we have the fourth largest military oral history collection in the country um, with over 2,000 recorded oral history interviews. Um, I, I believe our first goes back to the Spanish American War, not quite to the Civil War, um, but uh, they do go back quite a bit. And this is something I want to stress throughout again is that we have a very knowledgeable staff and we're very um, willing to help you, you all with your questions uh, that you, ha you have in your genealogy. So please don't be afraid to reach out. Um, we're, we're there to help. Okay, so um, Civil War genealogy, um, not, not too long ago, I guess it's been 10 years now, um, we, we observed the 150th anniversary of the Civil War. Um, this is a conflict about which more books have been written than any other conflict in American history. Um, it is something that seems close sometimes, but, but is, is multiple generations away, uh, far enough that, that stories have had a chance to, to grow and change over time and records um, have had a chance to maybe fall out of the public eye a little bit. So it can be challenging um, to find information about a Civil War veteran, but it's not impossible. Um, so I wanna talk about 
the, the types of records that you might want to look for, um, where you might want to look for those records, and then some kind of out of the ordinary sources where you might be able to find information as well. I am going to focus, at least in this presentation, kind of on an example of a Wisconsin uh, Civil War veteran. But again, I want to talk about how you might and where you might find these sources for other states as well. So, um, a theme throughout this presentation as well, um, although I'm going to be talking about a database that is online, a theme I want to stress is that not everything is online. Um, I have been running more and more into researchers and genealogists who who do their research almost exclusively online. And if they can't find something online, they assume that it doesn't exist. Um, and I, I do want to stress that that is not the case. Um, there are a lot of records that are not online yet and for, for a variety of reasons. So I really want to stress and encourage you to not limit your searching to just online. Sometimes Again, if you can't travel to a place, just because it's online doesn't mean you can't access it. You can contact the librarian or the archivist or the curator, and um, chances are they'll be more than happy to help you virtually by scanning things or taking pictures of things or that sort of thing. So um, please don't limit your searching to online only. That being said, <laughs> we do have an online Civil War database for um, Wisconsin Civil War soldiers. Now, this is um, men who served in Wisconsin units during the Civil War. This will not include men who might have lived in New York or Pennsylvania or Ohio during the Civil War and moved to Wisconsin afterwards. And that's a tricky part. And you know, if you if you search for your ancestor in here and you can't find them, um, please feel free to reach out and I can help work through that. I do it all the time. Um, but again, this is this is going to contain the names of the roughly 90,000 men who served in Wisconsin units during the Civil War. It is, in my opinion, a, a great database. It's incredibly searchable. Um, you can search by partial names. So in Wisconsin, for instance, we have a lot of German immigrants who have names that can be incredibly hard to spell and get spelled differently um, on every document that they appear on. So uh, if you know that your ancestor was John or Johan, or it appears a lot of different ways, you can just put J-O-H in the first name field. And if their last name is just something that gets butchered all the time, but it, it generally starts with S-C-H-W, um, you can just put S-C-H-W in the last name field. And then, you know, you might get 20 results, but you can kind of skim through them and find the one that resembles your ancestor um, and how their name is usually spelled. So there is some flexibility to this database. I would add though, um, and this is a problem that a lot of researchers seem to run into, you can't impress a database. Um, so sometimes researchers want to put in all of the information that they have about their ancestor, the first name, the last name, they want to put in the residence um, and, and all the other fields as well. They want to fill out as many fields as they can and then they're surprised when they get zero results. And unfortunately, the way the database works, if, if one of those fields is incorrect, um, it's gonna bring up zero results. So if, if you get the first name and the last name correct, but you thought they lived in Amro, but they wrote down Oshkosh as their residence, um, it's gonna come up with zero results. So my recommendation when searching a database like this and, and pretty much any database really is, um, to adopt a, a less is more philosophy. Start out by searching one field and one field only. And if you get too many results for you to handle, then try adding a second field, but don't, don't start out by trying multiple, multiple fields. This is a 90, it has roughly 90,000 um, entries in it, which sounds like a lot, but unless the name is John Smith or something, you're probably gonna be able to handle the results and just kind of skim through them. So something to keep in mind um, as you search databases. But again, if you have any trouble with any of this, feel free to reach out to me um, and I can help you um, navigate through that. So if you find um, some results, I searched for my last name and these are the results, some of the results that popped up. You can see that you're gonna get uh, their name, their residence, if, if we have one, um, their rank, 
and the really important information that we need, and I'm going to stress this throughout the presentation, in terms of Civil War genealogy, what you want to find most of the time is their regiment and their company. Regiment is really the most important. There are a lot of Civil War records that are arranged by regiment um, and not necessarily by last name. Sometimes within the regiment, they're um, arranged alphabetically by last name. Uh, but often you have to figure out that regiment first. So that's an important piece of information for you to know wherever and whenever you find it, um, the regiment. And, and I'll talk a little bit about the types of regiments later too. Um, you get uh, in this database, you get their, the date they entered the service, the date they exited. And there's a remarks field that will tell you if they were killed or taken prisoner, uh, promoted, all that kind of stuff. And then the really important link is this uh, request more info. If you click on that, it'll take you to a little form and that will send an email to us to let us know that you're interested in this individual. And then we can kind of go from there talking about some of the different resources that we have available at the museum. Um, for instance, and this is probably one of the more effective um, resources we have for learning about a Civil War ancestor, we have on microfilm, uh, the official muster and descriptive roles for the state of Wisconsin during the Civil War. Now, I know I'm talking about Wisconsin in this case, but there should be a similar source um, in all of the states of the Union during the Civil War. So if your ancestor was from Indiana or Maine um, or Delaware, uh, that state should have something similar to this. Um, and that would be the place to look. And that's one of the reasons too why the regiment is so important, because no matter where they were living, we certainly had some people who were living in Illinois or Minnesota or Michigan who, who for whatever reason came into Wisconsin to enlist and they served in a Wisconsin unit. So they're gonna show up in Wisconsin records regardless of where they were living. Um, so that's why knowing the regiment is important. If they served in a Wisconsin regiment, that's where you're going. If they served in a New York regiment, that's the place where you should go to look for their records, um, generally speaking. So the muster and descriptive roles um, again, generally speaking, there's not, um, they're not all filled out exactly the same uh, or, or completely, I guess, but there is the, the potential um, that they're going to have their name, their rank, when they got into the service, as well as some, you start getting into some interesting genealogical information like their age, uh, MS, it stands for marital status. So S is single, M is married. It's gonna have their eye color, hair color, complexion, um, their height, and their occupation, which can all be pretty interesting stuff to learn about someone who lived, you know, over 150 years ago. Um, again, this is kind of a typical record for whatever reason, they're not all filled in completely. So we can't guarantee that it's going to have all of this information about your ancestor, but it's gonna be close. Um, this is the type of information that was recorded um, in military records. There's another page to the muster and descriptive role that has, in addition, their, their residence, uh, where they were credited to for draft purposes, which um, is usually the same as their residence, but sometimes can be a little different. And that's a whole other story that I'm happy to talk to you all about if you're, you're interested. Um, and then there's this remarks field. And this is, this is a little bit of an extreme example. They're not usually quite this large, but um, the remarks field can contain a lot of really interesting information about um, if they were sick or wounded, it will tell you which hospital they were receiving care at. Uh, if they were detached for service to a different unit for a, a period of time, it's going to talk about that. Promotions, wounds, um, all those things will get mentioned in here. Um, and it's, it's interesting, but going back to the point I made at the beginning of this presentation, this is chock full of abbreviations and jargon. And it's really hard to make out if you don't know what you're looking at. So this is a, a good example of how if you if you get these records and you're having trouble understanding what they say, we can very often help out with that. Um, so again, these are the muster and descriptive roles. I do want to talk about from from experience of what what people ask, um, just reiterate kind of what they contain. So they do include often usually uh, information about the age, the marital status, physical description, uh, occupation of the veteran. Um, unfortunately, they do not include date of birth, 
names of parents, spouses, or children, uh, or information about post-war life. Okay, so sometimes people will contact us and say, yeah, you know, I see that you have four John Smiths in this database. I want to try to figure out which one is my ancestor. Can you tell me what the names of his parents were? And we don't have that information. It's not in these records. Um, to find that information, I think it's usually better to go to vital records like census or those types of things. Um, they are not in these Civil War muster and descriptive roles. Also, um, to, to reiterate my point from earlier, uh, I, I think Illinois might have their muster and descriptive roles online. I am not aware of another state that does. Um, these are generally not available online. So you have to contact the state um, to find out where they're kept, how they're accessible, and, and go from there. If you, if you just search online for this information, you're not going to find it, and, and you could miss out on what I think is some pretty good and interesting information. Um, so again, muster and descriptive roles are a really great resource for finding out about Civil War ancestors. I want to talk real briefly about some other um, information that we have at the Wisconsin Veterans Museum for Wisconsin veterans. Um, we, we can create a certificate of service uh, which summarizes a lot of the information that's in our database. It also can list um, battles that the veteran almost certainly participated in. It gets a little tricky because sometimes men were, were sick or wounded or detached for service with a different unit, and it's hard to tell exactly which battles they served in. Um, so this is a list of battles that their regiment participated in during the time that they were with that unit. Um, and it's, it's usually pretty accurate. And then there's a regimental history um, to give you an idea of, of where the regiment served, uh, where they trained, what they were up to, um, where they were when the war ended, all that kind of stuff. So, uh, and other institutions might have um, information like this as well. This is something that is produced mainly for genealogists who might want to have something to display or show um, to highlight their, their Civil War ancestor. So um, important questions. So if, if going back to the idea of military genealogy and approaching it as, as similar to foreign genealogy, um, you can save yourself a lot of time and effort um, by understanding a little context of what you're looking into in the Civil War. Um, it will help you rule out sources, hone in on, on good sources, and a lot of that. So for instance, there were 2 million Union soldiers um, who served in the Civil War, okay? Um, in terms of figuring out, you know, where you might need to look to find information about them, it, it can be helpful to know how that 2 million breaks down into branches of service, um, because that can affect where you look for information. So of those 2 million Union soldiers, 3,000 were Marines. There were only three, uh, roughly 3,000 Marines who served in the Civil War. Okay, so there's a pretty small chance, if you're not sure, um, that your ancestor served in the Marine Corps. There were about 75,000 um, regular Army troops. So these are men who served in the Federal Army, not a state unit, but a, a federal unit during the Civil War. 75,000. Again, a very, very small proportion. There were about 110,000 uh, sailors who served in the Navy during the Civil War. Um, so larger than the other two combined, but still a very, very small piece of this pie. The remaining 1.8 million Civil War um, soldiers were in volu the Volunteer Army, which is sort of the equivalent of today's National Guard. They were men who served in state-based units. And again, that's why that regiment is so important to know because it's gonna help you figure out which state to look for the records. Uh, you might also see, you know, in an obituary and family lore, you might see or hear reference to a, a type of unit that they were in. And it's important to understand kind of how the units relate to each other. Because again, that can help determine where you're searching or, or how you're searching. So in the Civil War, generally speaking, the smallest unit um, was a company, 
and companies generally have a letter associated with them. So company A, company B, um, that's gonna be a useful piece of information, but only if it is used in conjunction with a regiment, okay? The regiment is the second uh, smallest unit, I guess. Company is usually about 100 men, a regiment is about 1,000 men. Um, but that regiment is going to be, again, what's going to determine where you're looking for information. If they were in the 13th Pennsylvania Infantry Regiment, um, that narrows it down to 1,000 men right there <laughs> and tells you to look in Pennsylvania. Uh, if, you happen to know that, if you happen to know that they were in Company D of the 13th Pennsylvania, um, that's great. That narrows it down even further. Um, but um, So company and regiment are kind of the big ones. You might hear about brigades. Uh, the Iron Brigade from Wisconsin is very well known. That it's about 5,000 men. Um, it's usually about five regiments. You know, uh, brigades were often mixed. The Iron Brigade had regiments from Wisconsin, regiments from Michigan, regiments from Indiana. So that's not going to help quite so much. That might help with some of the other type of um, complementary research or contextual research that you can do later on. Um, after you found out about your individual uh, veteran, but um, brigade, the next level up is a division. Uh, there's there are corps, and then there's armies. You might hear armies were named after rivers in the Union, so the Army of the Potomac, the Army of the Tennessee. Um, at that point, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of men. Um, and if that's the only information you have about your ancestor, I know he served in the Army of the Potomac. That's going to be a, a tough start to search. Um, so again, to kind of sum this all up, what do I need to know about my Civil War ancestor to help me find the most information? Try to find out their regiment. Um, and I'm going to talk about some ways that you can, some some ways that you can find that information sometimes. Some other places you can look. All right. So in Wisconsin, um, there were three separate veterans censuses. I never know the plural of census. Censi censuses taken. Um, in 1885, 1895, and 1905. So the state went throughout the border here um, and tried to record information about the veterans who were living in the state. This gets tricky because you start getting what I talked about at the beginning, people who may have served in New York, but who moved to Wisconsin afterwards, okay? They're gonna show up in here. Um, it doesn't mean that they're gonna necessarily be found, information about their service might not be found in Wisconsin records, but um, this does list the unit that they served in, okay? So that, that's where that's gonna be helpful. So even if someone served in the New York unit, it's gonna show up in here as the 12th New York Infantry, and that can then lead you back to New York to find information about their service. Wisconsin did this, other states did this as well. It might be worth asking about um, veteran censuses in, uh, in whatever state they were, they were living in after their service. Okay, so if you happen to know where they passed away, if you happen to know that they went out west and settled in South Dakota or something, um, reach out to those states and see if they took veterans, if they took a census of veterans there. I avoided having to say it plural. Um, Grand Army of the Republic Post. So we, I talked about that a little bit at the beginning. The origin of our museum is, is the GAR. Um, GAR posts were formed a lot like VFW posts and American Legion posts. They were generally formed in communities. Um, so this, uh, this particular graphic that I'm showing here is from a, a La Crosse, Wisconsin GAR post. Um, they're often named after Civil War veterans who, who may have come from the community. And it can be a way to find out more. The GA, so to you had to be a Union veteran to be um, offered membership in a GAR post, which means you had to prove um, that you were a veteran of the Civil War. So GAR records might contain information about the unit that they served in or other information about their service. Um, this can come in a, a published roster like this one. It could be a newspaper article listing the new members of a GAR post. It could be in a membership book or meeting minutes. Um, there are a lot of different angles to take on the GAR front. Um, there's no specific way that GAR records were treated as the post started to close. It would be great if they were all given to 
a particular library or archives and then you can find them all there, but that is not the case. Um, we have quite a few JR records at the Wisconsin Veterans Museum. I know that the Wisconsin Historical Society has quite a few as well. Some are kept in local historical societies. Sometimes when the posts closed, the, the secretary took the records home with them and they might be living in someone's attic. Um, unfortunately, uh, searching for Grand Army of the Republic records can be a little hit and miss, but um, it, it's something, it's an option, it's out there. Okay, so here's an example of um, the inside of this roster of this GR post. And again, you can see that it does list the members and it lists the unit that they served in. And you can see the, the variety of states listed there as well. Okay, um, so when you know the, the regiment that your ancestor served in, a really rich resource can, to find out more about them um, maybe not a specific mention of them, but to get an idea of what they were doing and, and the battles that they served in and the conditions that they faced can be finding regimental histories. Um, so not every Civil War unit has a regimental history written about them. Um, as you can imagine, there were thousands and thousands of units and people tend to write about the things that interest them. So uh, there are some units that maybe haven't been found quite as interesting yet, and, and there have not been uh, histories written of them. But if you do happen to find a regimental history for your ancestors unit, try to get a copy of it, try to visit a library and see them. Um, this is an example of a history of the 38th Wisconsin Infantry Regiment that was written very soon after the war in 1866. And inside of it, in addition to kind of a, a narrative that traces what the unit did. Um, in the back of this particular book, it lists short biographical sketches of some of the officers. Um, so it can be a, a nice surprise if you find your ancestor uh, mentioned in name or maybe find a biographical sketch about them. Um, that can obviously be very exciting. Uh, in addition to the Grand Army of the Republic, which again was the, the major veterans organization from the Civil War, many regiments held reunions as well. Um, and it, you might be able to find proceedings or minutes or other documents from those regimental reunions. And these often can contain um, write-ups of, of these, these veterans reminiscing about their service. Um, it can talk about, um, it can mention names for, for men who didn't make it and might give some details about why they didn't make it. Maybe they were sick. Maybe we just found out that they passed away. Uh, maybe they moved out west. Um, so there can be some surprising information in these as well um, that can, can help you in your genealogical research. Another, I'm taking a quick drink here, pardon me. A, a potentially rich source of information um, in the late 19th century, uh, there kind of was a fad of publishing county histories. Um, so you can see that here is a history of Waukesha County in Wisconsin that was printed in 1880. Um, I think it was a subscription-based thing. And again, it, it, it was very, very, very popular for a while, and then it kind of disappeared. But um, this covers a, a time when Civil War veterans were prominent local citizens often. So if you look in these uh, county histories from the late 19th century, they often included biographical sketches of, of prominent citizens. Again, I think they probably maybe had to pay a little money to get their name in these, but maybe not all the time. Um, but, you know, if your ancestor was a Civil War veteran and you know what county they were living in in the, the late 19th century, there's a decent chance they're going to show up in, in one of these county histories. Um, it can, you can see the, the difference in length of some of these, depending on, on what they were up to. So, but, it, but it can give you some details, um, not just about their military service, but if you were wondering about their life outside of the military, it might uh, fill in some holes that you had. Uh, so that's something to think about as well. In terms of the National Archives records, um, so the National Archives is going to have military records for most, if not all, Union veterans of the Civil War. 
um, the amount of information in them is going to vary just a little bit. Sometimes it's kind of just a, a bunch of copies of um, muster cards that kind of establish who they were serving with and, and that they were still with their unit throughout the war. Sometimes it can be a little bit more. Um, you also might have heard talk of pension records, Civil War pension records, and those are also kept at the National Archives. I'll talk about those a little more in a bit, but just to, to really pound this home, in my experience, generally speaking, pension records are not available online, okay? Um, I'll talk later about Ancestry.com and what they have relating to pension records, but it is not the full pension record. Um, in my experience, the only way to get a full pension record is to request them from the National Archives. Um, and that is going to um, cost money and it's going to take time. It's not something that can be done um, very quickly. Uh, you can request these records online through the National Archives. Um, they're gonna ask for information. And again, that's where that knowing the regiment is going to come in handy, knowing a company might come in handy as well, but certainly the regiment, it will help them in their search. Um, but you're not gonna find them online. You can request them online, but then you will have to wait and get the records from them when they have time. And pension records can be a really fantastic source of information. Um, when Civil War veterans or their, their families applied for pensions, um, they basically had to make a case for why they deserved a pension, which means that they had to talk about what illness they, um, they caught while they were serving or what sort of wound um, they received during their service. They often had to get corroboration from soldiers who served with them or doctors or friends or members of the community who have known them um, who would chime in and say, yes, I know that you know, John Doe hasn't been able to keep steady work because his war wound is bothering him so much. Um, there can be you know, medical records in there, copies of letters. It can be a really rich source of information. Um, but they can be expensive too. So you just kind of have to decide for yourself if this is a, a path you want to pursue. Um, but if you're if you're one of those people who just wants to find everything there possibly is, I would I would encourage you to consider the pension records. Okay, so in terms of other um, resources that you might want to find letters, and these are not Civil War letters, unfortunately, I, <laughs> I had a picture of World War II letters handy. Um, also, just um, just so you know, these are not how we store rec or letters at the Wisconsin Veterans Museum. This is how we receive them. <laughs> we do actually store them in, in folders and boxes and all that. But uh, obviously, if you can find letters that your ancestor wrote, um, that's fantastic. And that's great. And, you know, um, chances are that after 160 years, uh, the best chance that you have of finding your ancestors' letters are if someone donated them to an archives. Um, and that's something that I'll talk a little bit more about later, but um, it's unlikely at this point that the family after four generations is still <laughs> holding on to these. It's not impossible, but it's unlikely. Um, and and if, if someone does still have them in the family, it's going to be hard to find them. Um, so, but, but letters from, from your ancestor obviously can be really useful and interesting. The other thing I would encourage you to think about in going back to the, the unit thing, if you can find letters um, that were written by someone who served in the same unit as your ancestor, that can also be really interesting because that person ate the same food, fought in the same battles, experienced the same weather and conditions. So you can learn a lot about what your ancestor might have gone through by reading letters from someone who served in the same unit. Something to think about. Um, images, uh, still images from the Civil War. Photography was still fairly new. Um, so there were a lot of different types of still images that Civil War soldiers may have had taken. Um, this is an example of a tin type, which is um, on a, a sheet of metal. There were glass plate amber types. There were carte de visites that were on kind of a card stock. Um, obviously, finding an image of your ancestor is probably a big uh, want for all of you, um, but much like the letters, uh, it's going to often come down to if someone in the family or the veteran themselves decided to donate it somewhere um, where it could be kept and made available. 
uh, unfortunately, you know, in, in the military today, a lot of pictures are taken um, and kept. Uh, but in the Civil War, it was it was largely up to the soldiers themselves to to pay to have a photographer take their picture. They'd often send them back to their family and friends. Um, the the army didn't keep a copy of a picture of every soldier. The state didn't keep a, a copy of a picture of every soldier. So um, finding these images can be can be difficult. Um, but another point that I want to make about the images is sometimes they can contain information about your ancestor if you're having trouble finding anything out about them. Um, going back to the idea of asking for help from people who know, um, this is a tintype that shows a Civil War soldier wearing a five button sack coat. Um, it might not mean a whole lot to you, but I can tell you that there were only about four or five regiments from Wisconsin who wore this type of coat. As far as we know, there weren't other states that wore this coat. So just by looking at this image, we can narrow down the search for this person to about five regiments, about 5,000 men um, out of 90,000 from Wisconsin or 2 million from the United States. So um, again, don't, don't underestimate the amount of information that might be um, contained in, in a still image. I mentioned uh, our library before, and you know, not just our library, but uh, all libraries might contain printed letters, printed diaries, memoirs, reminiscences, biographies, those regimental histories that I was talking about, the county histories that I was talking about. They might have um, the GAR, printed GAR uh, materials. Uh, there can be a lot of information in these. And, and like with the letters, um, even if you can't find something directly about your ancestor, if you can find a book about his regiment, if you can find edited letters written by someone who was in the same unit, um, it can all, or, or a book about a battle that they served in, um, that can all be a, a different angle to take to find out information about your ancestor. All right, I am just about done here. So I want to encourage you to visit our website, um, particularly if you have an ancestor from Wisconsin who served in the military. I know this is about civil war, but any, any other conflict, you can check us out as well. Um, on this page, you're going to want to go to this research tab right here. This is where you're going to find some of our databases and links to contact us to find out more information about your ancestors. So our website address is right there. I think it's also in the handout. Um, please be sure to check us out. Uh, there are a lot of other uh, places you can look for information. The Wisconsin Historical, Historical Society for Wisconsin, but really in any state, that the State Historical Society is a great place to start in your search for information about a Civil War veteran. Um, even if they don't have the muster and descriptive roles, or if they don't have some of these other sources that I've been talking about, they're probably in the best position to know where those resources might be kept in the state. Um, so that's what I would recommend. There aren't a lot of other states that have veterans museums quite like us. Um, so I would recommend starting with the State Historical Society in other states. Um, public libraries are, in my opinion, an underused resource sometimes in, in genealogy. Um, a lot of public libraries keep files on local veterans. They might have GAR records and um, knocking down a couple points there. They often have the local newspaper on microfilm. And I want to talk about newspapers. They are such an incredible source of information for military genealogy. Um, during times of war, local newspapers will, especially during the Civil War, printed whole letters um, that soldiers wrote home. They included updates about local people in the service, um, obviously casualty lists. Um, and these aren't always online, again, um, but I think they're worth checking out if you're really kind of going for the anything, everything approach. Um, find out where your ancestor was living at the time they enlisted, or might be where their parents were living, um, and find that local newspaper and just kind of skim through it for the war years. And you might be surprised at what you find. Uh, I do have the 1930 census on here. I mean, if 
by then Civil War veterans were probably um, passing pretty quickly, but uh, if they happened to have been alive in 1930, in that particular census, they did ask the question of, are you a veteran? And if so, what, um, what conflict did you serve in? So that can be a way to confirm whether or not someone served in the Civil War. Um, so I've been talking about this a little bit, but I do want to stress it a little bit, especially with um, Ancestry.com and, and pension records. So uh, Ancestry.com is an incredible resource. I use it all the time. Um, there's so much useful information on there. And to be fair to them, they, they do a good job of telling you what you're looking at. It's all in, sometimes it's in small writing, um, but they'll tell you what you're looking at. Uh, in terms of Civil War genealogy, I can tell you that they have the Civil War Pension Index on Ancestry.com. So that means that you can use Ancestry.com often to find out if your ancestor received a Civil War pension, but it is not the pension record, okay? So I think I've run into quite a few genealogists who when I ask them, oh, did you consider requesting a pension record? Oh, I found it on, I found it on Ancestry.com. Um, it, it's not the whole picture. There's so much more in the pension record. So just be careful when you're doing online research that you understand what you're looking at, that you have a, a full picture of if this is a complete record or if this is an index um, to shoot ahead of a few decades in terms of World War I, Ancestry.com has um, draft registration records, which does not mean that that person served. It just means that they registered for the draft. So that's just an, another example of how like sometimes when genealogists find these records, they get really, really excited and they don't necessarily pay attention to what type of record they're seeing. So just keep that in mind as you're looking um, and I want to really stress this, everything is online, right? Um, there's so much that's not online. I mentioned newspapers on the last slide, and I've been running more and more into genealogists who, when I recommend newspaper research, will say, well, I, I searched online and didn't find anything. There's nothing. Um, there are a lot of newspapers that have been digitized and put online. Um, but again, you have to be really careful about what you're seeing and what you're looking at. You can go to sites like newspapers.com and they might have the local newspaper for your ancestor, but they might not have a complete run of it. They might only have certain years. And if you're not paying attention to that, you can search for your ancestor's name, not find anything, assume that there's not an article written about them. But if you really looked close, you might find that the run for this newspaper didn't start until 1935, um, which might be after your ancestor died. So um, as, as inconvenient as it might seem, um, you, you can't just search online. You have to reach out to libraries, to archives, to museums, to historical societies and ask, like, do you have this type of record? You can ask them, is it online? Um, and if they say no, then you might have to figure out a different way to access it. But please don't um, just rely on online sources. And the last thing I'd say is about family lore. There is almost always a kernel of truth to family lore. Um, but the further away from the event that you get, the more likely the chance that those, that that kernel of truth has been embellished or added on to. Um, and I've run into a lot of genealogists who are just dead set on proving the family story or who are letting that family story drive their research. I know my ancestor served at Gettysburg. I know that he was wounded there. And even though all of the other evidence is suggesting that he served in a unit that wasn't anywhere near Pennsylvania in July 1863, they are just insisting on finding that record that proves it. Um, and I think we just have to remember that we need to take family more with a, a little bit of a grain of salt and don't let it drive or control your research. All right, just a quick plug for our museum. Um, I do want to encourage you as genealogists to think about if you have original materials uh, from your ancestor, what is going to happen to those original materials after you? Um, it seems like generally speaking, the interest in these sorts of things is declining. And I've talked to so many people who say, I don't think my kids or my nephews or my nieces are gonna want this when I'm gone. I don't know what's gonna happen to it. And if you think it's valuable and worth keeping, you might wanna consider donating it to a museum or an archives. Um, just something to think about. We are always looking for volunteers at our museum to help us get more resources online. 
Um, we encourage you to visit our museum so you can feel safe and also just spread the word about us. Um, we are the Wisconsin Veterans Museum. We represent the entire state of Wisconsin. Um, and we want to make sure that folks in Appleton and all about Allegheny County and all over the, the state know about us and, and know that we're a, a resource that they can use. All right, and that's what I have. Here's all of my contact information. It should also be in the handout, um, but I'm happy to, to take any questions that you all have. Thank you so much, Russ. And I, I definitely want to plug the Wisconsin Veterans Museum again. Um, my One of my Civil War ancestors, my fourth great grandfather, the only photo I have of him, I got it through the Wisconsin Veterans Museum website. So definitely a great resource for everybody to use if you have Wisconsin ancestors or Wisconsin veterans in your family tree. Um, so a couple questions we had. Um, our first one is, if you ordered a Civil War military file of a person from the National Archives, what would be in it? Yeah, so um, the, the military file, I think, again, is a little bit hit and miss. A lot of times it's just copies of, of these muster cards. So every month um, uh, a regiment would do a, a muster, would kind of check and see who was still with them. Um, and these muster cards would just say, yep, he was present. Um, so, so a lot of times it's just gonna kind of establish and solidify the fact that he, he was serving with a particular unit through time. Um, sometimes you'll find letters that relate to them or orders that relate to them. But um, to be honest with you, I'm not sure how much bang for your buck you get with National Archives military files. I would really, if you're going to order things through the National Archives, I would, I would lean more heavily toward pension files. I agree. Yeah, I've ordered quite a few of for my ancestors and, you know, sometimes it's feast, sometimes it's famine. I've gotten ones that are 20 pages and I've gotten ones that are 200. It really depends on the extent of um, their claim, like, you know, if they were injured, if they really had to go through a process of, you know, um, making sure that they got an increase in, in their pension, things like that, you might have a larger file. Um, and I, I did want to point out, you know, don't just think about your, your ancestor who was a veteran, consider their siblings, you know, their, their brothers or their cousins who were also in there because I've gotten like affidavits from other, you know, direct descend or direct ancestors of mine in pension files of their siblings. So don't forget about, you know, collateral lines and things like that when you're looking at pension files. All right, our next one, um, I'm curious about when the National Archives marks your family member with a gold star. Do only persons who died in service get one? Um, she says she found her second great grandfather at fold three and he was one, um, but she was always always told that it was for those that died in battle and he did not die in battle. Well, so, I mean, the gold star, um kind of became a thing in World War I. It's not an official military decoration. Um, it was something that, you know, you could buy a gold star flag to put in your window. Um, there was an organization formed called Gold Star Mothers for, for mothers whose children died in the war. Um, I'm not 100% sure if that person is saying that on fold three, there was a gold star next to the person's name. And if that's the case, that's up to fold three, they can kind of do whatever they want. Um, but in terms of like a military decoration, the gold star is not a, an official military decoration, but, but it is it is meant to represent someone who died during their service. Yeah, and for those who are wondering how to use Fold3 a little bit better, um, we do have a program coming in August where we're going to be talking about how to use Fold3, the library edition. Um, so definitely check that out and, and join us to learn more about how to use that military um, resource as well. Our next question um, says, my ancestor served in New York. His wife and children moved to Wisconsin shortly before the end of his service. I wonder if he was granted land for his service. Any tips on where to find land grant information for Civil War veterans? Um, that's a good question. And that's an area that I'm not as familiar with as I probably should be. I need to look into it some more, but the, the question of land grants uh, comes up quite a bit. Um, I would probably recommend starting with the Wisconsin Historical Society. That seems like it would be more of a state record. Um, that would be my recommendation. To my knowledge, most of the land grants that I hear about were kind of out in the Dakotas um, and kind of on the frontier more, but it certainly could have happened in Wisconsin as well. 
All right. Our next question. I have one ancestor that lived in Wisconsin, but was a substitute for a man in New Hampshire, so his company was New Hampshire. How would I get more information on him, and was this a practice this practice common to you know serve as a substitute for somebody? Yeah, that's that's interesting. So the the practice of substitute was I don't know if I'd say common, but not not unheard of at all. So it, during the Civil War. Um, to make this as short as i can so generally speaking each county had a quota of men that they had to meet and if they could not meet that quota by volunteers they would have to enact a draft um drafts were obviously not very popular uh, in the 1860s with a bunch of immigrants who had left europe to escape conscripted military service um so if if a county had to do a draft and if if a person was drafted and did not want to serve they were able to hire a substitute they could pay money uh, to have someone else serve in their place. Um, so that's what a substitute is. It, again, it's not, I wouldn't say it's super duper common, but we certainly see plenty of examples of it in Wisconsin. Now to serve as a substitute in a different state, I'm not sure I've heard of that before. I wonder if they happen to be visiting New Hampshire or something, that, that's a little out of the ordinary. Um, but in terms of finding their military records, if he served in a New Hampshire unit, um, even if he was from Wisconsin, I would say those records are probably going to be in New Hampshire. Um, so that's what I would recommend. All right. Um, our next question, do you have any information on the GAR women's or widows organizations? Sure. So um, again, the GAR was a, an organization of union veterans, um, much like today the, uh, the American Legion or the VFW has an auxiliary. Um, there were auxiliary organizations associated with the GAR. Um, one was called, I think, the Ladies of the GAR, and one was called the Women's Relief Corps. Um, and those were composed of often the wives or daughters of, of Union veterans. We do have some records um, relating to Women's Relief Corps and Ladies of the GAR. They're not super extensive. A lot of the stuff I said about GAR records goes for them too. It's kind of spotty um, in terms of what happened to those records uh, as as the the camps closed. But yeah, we do we do have some for sure. And someone said um, the archives stopped producing copies of the pension files at the start of the pandemic, and she's been waiting almost two years. Um, so for those who are interested in um, getting those pension files through the National Archives, it might be a wait. Um, someone did type into the chat, though, that it might be more cost effective and faster to hire a researcher. And that's something that I also personally did. Like I had a bunch of pension files that I had to order, and it was way cheaper to find a, a DC researcher. And she just scanned all the pension files and emailed them to me. So that might be something that you know, as a workaround if you don't want to wait or pay the fee um, to the National Archives. Um, our next question is wondering, can you address the difference between Civil War records in St. Louis versus the DC National Archives? So my understanding is that almost all Civil War records are at the National Archives in DC. Um, St. Louis is the National Personnel Records Center and to my understanding, that mainly contains records from the 20th century. Um, so when you request a record from a World War I or a World War II veteran, that request goes to St. Louis. Um, but I believe that the, the Civil War requests go to DC. Yeah, that's my understanding too. <laughs> Um, someone's wondering, um, does the Wisconsin Veterans Museum have any records from the Harvey Hospital in Madison? I'm guessing that's a veterans hospital. I'm not sure. Yeah, really quickly. That's a really interesting story. So um, one of the wartime governors from Wisconsin, Lewis Harvey, um, went to visit some troops after the Battle of Shiloh. And while he was visiting them, he, um, he fell off a boat and drowned. Um, so his widow, Cordelia Harvey, kind of made it. Uh, her life's mission to establish a hospital in Wisconsin so that wounded troops didn't have to stay in hospitals in Tennessee or Virginia. They could come back home and recover um, with familiar faces and familiar voices. So she went out and met with President Lincoln to ask for money, and she was successful and, and got this Harvey Hospital started in Madison. Um, I would say we have limited records on Harvey Hospital. I, I do believe that the Wisconsin Historical Society has more records on, on Harvey Hospital. Great. Um, so someone's wondering, how would we go about um, trying to find the company and regiment of our ancestor? 
yeah. Um, so, I mean, I talked about some of the sources you can try for that. Um, you, you know, obituary, I, I forgot to mention this, but an obituary is an often overlooked piece of information for genealogy, especially for military genealogy. I don't think I've ever seen the obituary of a Civil War veteran that didn't talk about their service at least a little. I mean, it's often going to at least give you a regiment. Um, but, you know, so you know, I talked about the, um, the county histories and the rosters and all, all that kind of stuff. It, one of the big factors, I think, would be to figure out where they were living in 1860, find them in the 1860 census, and then contact that state and find out if they have some sort of roster that, that you could search for the name. Um, that would probably be the best way. Yeah, some also have it on their tombstone or like they have a specific Civil War, you know, tombstone. That's how I found one of my ancestors was a Civil War vet. So mm -hmm. um, someone is wondering, what is the best way to find out what newspapers existed um, near the cities that Civil War veterans lived and went home to? And I'm going to suggest Chronicling America. They have um, the uh, newspaper directory. Um, so you can look at what state, what county, what city, and then it will show you, like you can narrow down the time periods and it will show you what newspapers were in that area. That sounds like a great resource. I was going to say, um, call, call the nearest local library. Yeah. <laughs> That's a pretty good idea. <laughs> or, or definitely contact the local library. We're always happy to help. <laughs> yeah. um, someone's wondering, does the National Archives have both Union and Confederate files? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I, I think the short answer is yes, but I think the longer answer would be that Confederate records are much more sparse um, than Union records. Uh, I think, you know, the, the state of the Confederate government toward the end of the war was pretty, um, pretty rough and their ability to keep and maintain records was, was not that great. And there was probably a decent amount of destruction when, when Union, Union soldiers got into these kind of places. So I think they have some, um, but I don't think there's a whole lot on Confederate service. And someone um, typed in um, that the National Archives in Fold 3 are currently scanning some pension files and are recommending that you search their catalog for a pension file before requesting it. She says, last week this worked for me and I was able to get the entire Civil War pension file of a New York ancestor online for free by searching the National Archives catalog. So definitely take a look into that if you have a Civil War ancestor. Yeah, that is awesome. And and yeah, I check it out for sure. But I, the the idea I wanted to get across is just if you can't find it online, don't yes. don't stop there. Yes, not everything's online. Keep in mind there's lots and lots of Civil War veterans and it's gonna take a while to scan all those files. So maybe you'll get lucky, but you know, more often than not, you're gonna have to request it probably. So all right, our next question um, is asking about um, some gravestone um, things that it says. So it says M U S F N S 78 P A I N F. So I'm guessing that the end part is 78 um, Pennsylvania infantry, but what's the M U S F N S mean? So F N S means field and staff. And that just means, so in addition to the companies, um, there was a field and staff, which was kind of composed of usually the regimental level officers and the surgeon and the band. Um, there were, each regiment had a band usually at the start of the civil war and they were part of the field and staff. And I think the MUS means musician. Um, oh, cool. So my guess is that it means he was a musician in the field and staff of the 78th Pennsylvania Infantry. Um, someone asked in the chat before, they were trying to find Virginia Civil War records. Um, so do you know of a good resource? Oh, so, I mean, Virginia was technically in the Confederacy. Um, I, I would try the State Historical Society in Virginia to start out with. Um, again, yeah. even if they don't have the stuff, they probably have a decent idea of where to where to find it. I also posted a link to um, the Library of Virginia had a really great um, resource on their website about researching Civil War veterans from Virginia. So definitely check that out. Um, someone's wondering, is the database of muster and descriptor rules, descriptive rules that you have the same as the National Archives? Um, no, no, it's not the same. That's a good question. Okay, I, sorry, it took me a while to have that click. No, uh, in my experience, what we have in the muster and descriptive roles is is probably a little more informative than the National Archives records. Like Katie said, once in a while you'll you'll hit the jackpot with the National Archives and get quite a bit. But generally speaking, I think 
our muscular and descriptor goals are a pretty pretty great source. Um, someone's wondering if the museum has any information on protests by drafted German immigrants, particularly in Ozaku and Milwaukee counties. Yeah, um, we do have some info on that. There were draft riots in a couple different places in Wisconsin um, during the Civil War, and there were regiments sent to help quell them. Um, I believe we have books in our library. We're going to have information about the, the units that were sent to help restore order. Um, yeah, I think we can get you started on that search. Someone's wondering, um, were company photos ever taken um, during the Civil War? I mean, I wouldn't say never, um, but uh, they would be very, very, very rare. Um, the, the state of photography in the 1860s was such that you had to be perfectly still for a period of time in order to get a good image. And that was hard with one person. So the idea of having a hundred people stand perfectly still um, for five minutes or three minutes or whatever is, it's not gonna happen super often. So I, I've seen some group photos. I've seen a lot of times they made lithographs um, of companies uh, I think that were possibly based on photographs, but in terms of an actual still image of a company, it, it would be pretty rare. Yeah, or you might get one um, through the GAR, like after, way after the Civil War, of course, like those remaining who survived, of course. Um, our next question, did Civil War Service grant automatic um, United States naturalization to an immigrant from Germany, thus circumventing the normal naturalization process? That's a really good question, and I'm not sure I have a great answer for that. Um, I, I think it was, a, <laughs> as weird as it sounds, I think it was kind of a case-by-case -case basis. Like, I've, I've heard of that happening, um, but I've also seen cases where someone who served in the Civil War later was naturalized. So uh, I think it was kind of a, it, it depends sort of answer. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> Um, our next question, my third great grandfather was in a German speaking unit out of New York. He joined when he was 36 years old. Is it true that immigrants automatically became citizens? Oh, so basically the same question for serving the Civil War. And if so, was there some kind of record issued to show he was a citizen of the United States? So again, you'd be looking for naturalization records. And again, it's kind of a case by case basis. So narrowing down when they were naturalized, like looking at the census um, records, like the early 1900 censuses will tell you if they were naturalized. Um, I think it's the 1920 even says what year they were naturalized. So um, definitely take a look at those census records. Um, someone's wondering, where can you find Civil War specific tombstone emblems or symbols? Um. So uh, often Civil War veterans have a, a emblem on a post next to their grave. It's a GAR emblem. Um, I think those were handed out by the GAR at the time. I don't, I don't know for sure <laughs> where you'd find those. Now, do you think that's the, the question is like, where would I get one or? Or I think they're wondering like how to figure out what they mean. Maybe. Oh, sure. Okay. Okay. Um, feel free to, to ask us uh, if you find one that you can't figure out where we have some experience with that. We can probably help find a, a, a resource that would answer those questions. Okay. Um, someone's wondering if there's record showing the draftees who hired a substitute so they didn't have to serve in the Civil War and like where would you locate those records? I don't know if there's a, a resource that kind of does that level of it. There, there are records that show who was drafted um, and if you look through the, the muster and descriptive roles, you'll see substitute under some names. But in my experience, it doesn't say substitute for John Doe. And similarly in the draft records, in my experience, it doesn't say bought a substitute named whoever. So, um, it would take a lot of, you could probably piece it together if you really wanted to, but um, you might, that might be another case where newspapers might come in handy. Um, it's, it's possible that in a, a, a county that held the draft, there might be articles about, you know, John Doe hired a substitute named whoever. 
Yeah. We have another question about, um, someone says, it's hard to determine if their specific ancestors serve because there's so many people from the same area with those names. So how do you kind of um, get around that problem of trying to figure out if it's your ancestor who served and not somebody else that same name? It's really hard. Like I said, in the muster and descriptive roles, there's not a lot of personally identifiable information. It, it lists their age at the time of enlistment. So from that, you can kind of figure out a rough view of birth. Um, some of them will list a, a place of birth, but that, again, can be awfully vague. Sometimes it'll just say Germany, uh, which doesn't really help letter, you know, Norway for all the um, Ole Olsons. Um, it, it, the best way is to just use a variety of sources, you know, check the obituary, check um, their, their gravestone, look in census records. Um, Ancestry is a great source for that because you can find some different they have some different resources there for civil war that can that can help lead to the right place but it can be it can be tough it, that can be a tough thing with really common names um we're happy to help as much as we can yeah short of and or ordering pension files and reading through all of them i mean that can get expensive if you have you know four or five of people with the same name in the same area trying to determine which one's your ancestor but you know maybe schedule a trip to dc and and have a research day <laughs> Um, someone's wondering where would they would find Spanish American war records? Sure. So um, actually on our website, we do also have a Spanish American war database. Um, this is getting into the weeds a little, but I guess I would quick mention that um, there are two conflicts that are separate conflicts, but are often mashed together. Um, the Spanish American war was fought for about three months in 1898 uh, between the United States and Spain. Um, Immediately following that, there was another conflict, um, which is called the Philippine-American War that was fought between the United States and, and Philippines. <laughs> um, and they're often, because they happen so close and they're a little related, they're often pushed together, um, but they're two separate conflicts. So we do have information about Wisconsin soldiers who served in the Spanish-American War. Um, the Philippine-American War gets a little trickier because most of them served in federal units. So most of that information is on the federal level. Um, but in terms of like, I don't know if, if it's not from Wisconsin, um, again, I would kind of go the same route and start with the State Historical Society and, and ask where those records are kept. Um, someone's asking about court records. She said, um, would court records be helpful in the case-by-case -case situations we mentioned? Um, so like with naturalization, yes, you know, definitely look at those naturalization records yeah. and see um, if they got it, you know, due to their service or not, um, or definitely check out, you know, your state historical society or genealogy society or any resources, depending on where your ancestor lived. Yeah. Um, our next question is, did every man have to register for the Civil War draft? Um, no. Um, again, in the grand scheme of things, I don't think many counties in Wisconsin had to hold a draft. Um, no one wanted to have a draft. It was incredibly unpopular. So, so counties made huge pushes to meet their quotas by volunteers. And that's, I don't know if you remember when we looked at the muster and descriptive roles, but there was a separate line for credited to do for draft purposes. Um, when, a, when a county met its quota, um, men from that county who wanted to enlist would often go to different counties where they would receive a, a bonus, a, an enlistment bonus, a huge enlistment bonus sometimes from counties that were desperately trying to meet their quotas so that they didn't have to hold a draft. So as long as a county met their quota, they didn't have to hold a draft. They didn't have to register anyone for the draft. And the counties that did have to register for the draft um, I don't remember the exact age range, but there was there was an age range. So not every man, it was men within a certain um, age range. Yeah, uh, similar question. Um, someone says their ancestor was drafted from newspaper accounts. They know that they were, um, but, not, but did not serve in the Civil War, probably due to health because he died several years later. That's what she's assuming. Um, would this be reflect, reflected in the draft record that, you know, why he didn't serve? That's an interesting question. Um, so it sounds like a newspaper account mentioned that he was drafted. I've seen cases of this where men were drafted and then soon afterwards were discharged for medical reasons and they just don't really show up in the records at all. Yeah, yeah, I think that's very likely um, the case. And if that is the case, 
it, it might be difficult to find um, a lot of documentation for that. Yeah, definitely check newspapers, but it sounds like maybe you, this person already has. So, you know, sometimes you can't always find every little bit of detail um, in those those cases, unfortunately, or maybe they have a diary that you haven't come across that would would talk about that. But um, so it looks like those were all our questions that we had. Again, thank you so much, Russ, for all the information and for all you do at the Wisconsin Veterans Museum. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And be sure to mark your calendar for May 14th for our next Find Your Ancestors session. And again, it's going to be on using Ancestry.com and getting the most out of it. And I hope you join us. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Take care.